to take out this test match and the series. Another very questionable LBW decision seals South Africa's fate. But the smiles are on the England faces. The crowd pours onto the ground. Goff's done the trick. The Yorkshire heroes delivered the goods. England in raptures. It's been a long, hard road for the likes of Stewart and Hussein. They've actually done it. A winning start for Alex Stewart in charge of England. Well, if you're anything like my age, which is 40, you probably grew up watching this era of cricketer. You have two of my heroes. And NASA, of course, who's joining us. We have Alex Stewart, whose birthday is today. How are you, Stewie? Very, very well, Keezy. Feeling old, but well. Hey, I tell you what, you've aged a bit this last few years, Stewie. Was that after last season's Surrey performances or what? No, that's it. You see. I've, been, I've been using your uh, Stay Young cream, but I've run out of it. <laughs> well, and as you've probably guessed, before I even introduced him, he's jumped in. We have one of England's best bowlers, actually. Uh, Darren Goff, one of the great characters as well of English cricket. How are you, Goffy? I'm all right, mate. I'm in the office, sat here. Big library behind me, you know what I mean? Read all them books I read. Took them on tour with me everywhere, them books. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start off with Nass and Stewie. Um, I didn't realise, because I know there's an age difference between you two, there's a bit of a gap. You made your debuts on the same day. What are your memories of that? Well, obviously, Jamaica... Um... 1989, I was 21, so I'm guessing, Al, how old were you, Al? 26, 7? 71. <laughs> <laughs> and we got out there, and, I mean, for me, it was an absolute thrill, not playing with Alec, but to come up <laughs> against that side that we had grown up. I had grown up. You talk about growing up watching um, these three old fogies. I would grown up watching 5-0 black washes with Viv Richards and... Malcolm Marshall and Gordon Greenwich, and there you are at Jamaica, at Sabina Park, standing short leg, and Viv Richards, Gordon Greenwich, Desmond Haynes were there. So it was an absolute thrill for me to make my debut um, against that side. And we were a load of young guns, weren't we, Al? We didn't, weren't given much of a chance, but we did all right. No, it was, well, it's a massive moment, isn't it? You know, for all of us, the first time you get handed your, your test cap and keys. I listened to you last week when you said, you know, it was a special moment for you when Nass just threw it at you and went, I don't know why you got one of these. Um, I but, still don't know why, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but no, when Gucci told me, probably the same with Nass, Gucci told me the night before that I'd be playing, and, and it was, it was all your schoolboy dreams had come true. Um, you know, I'd have sat in a maths lesson, chemistry lesson, whatever, not listening to the teacher, but dreaming of playing for England. And then this moment is going to happen. Um, and then when it is, it is absolutely wonderful, wonderful moment. You know, I've always said, you know, my most proudest moment of my career was my very, very first test cap because anything that happened after, um, yeah, was good. But the first one was very, very special for me. But I will pick you up, I think, Nass, on what you said, fielding short leg. Are you sure you did short leg, not me? No, I, I definitely was at short leg. I've got footage. I've got some kind of proof that I was at short leg. I, I definitely remember being short leg to Viv Richards. Absolutely. The, Gucci or mate Gucci wouldn't put you in at short leg. Sure. Well, I ended up in short leg, so you were either useless or had been dropped by then. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Goffy, does this does this sort of sum up the nine? I mean, it was I remember it just watching it being so tough. But if we look at their debut, I know this is just before this is before you started, but does this sort of sum it up? The bowling attack of England, good bowlers, don't get me wrong. Gladstone Small, Devon Malcolm, Angus Fraser, David Capel. But in return, the West Indies, Patterson, Bishop, Marshall. Courtney Walsh. Does that sort of sum up the era a little bit? Was it the era for great bowlers? Um, I, I would say so. You're better off asking the batters than that. But I was there in 89. I was actually in May, uh, with Yorkshire on pre-season. So I watched the Barbados Test match um, um, back in 89. Um, it, was, it was unbelievable just to be around and watch them in the nets and then watch some of the cricket. So... But growing up watching that sort of cricket, it's the one that got me interested in it. Um, watching a test match up close and personal like that uh, is inspiring, if I'm going to be honest. And, and these guys, like I said, only a couple of years later, I will probably play against that. I'd already played against Gat. I don't know if Gat was there in 89. I can't remember. But I remember debut in 89. I only played two games. But after that, I gradually started playing more and more games. But it was still not a bad attack that 
that England attack. I mean, Devon Malcolm, I, I remember him in, was it Barbados where he spun Viv's cap round or was that somewhere else doing? That might have been Jamaica, wasn't it, Nass? I can't remember eating. I can remember eating him. I don't know if I watched that or and his cap spun round. I, I thought it was Barbados. But... Yeah, you might be right. But what Devon will never, ever forget is the magnificent bit of fielding um, to actually get. It was a Greenwich and Haynes opening partnership. I don't know how many they put on in the first innings of our debut test, Nass. But when the ball went down a fine leg, they ran two to Dev because he fumbled it. And then actually he threw it like a tracer bullet straight over the stumps to Jack Russell. Oh, he's fumbled that one. And they're coming back for a second. This is a good throw. This could be out. He's got him. Yes, he's gone. He's out run out. Beautiful sort of throw in there from the deep. Devon Malcolm fumbled the ball. In came the throw. And boy, over the bales it was. England have struck. And we have a run out. And this is very naive thinking by the batsman here. In fact, he goes to Paul. He's looking aggressive. The ball goes down to Devon Malcolm. Devon Malcolm doesn't pick it up cleanly. You see the fumbles and what a throw right over the top of the stumps and the batsman doesn't make it. What a beautiful throw. And there he is, patently out. Magnificent play by Devon Malcolm. But Devon has always said it was a tactic. <laughs> <laughs> he actually was thinking outside the box. Thought he'd just push the ball to one side, pick it up and then was it in. He, he couldn't catch a ball, Dev, but he had a serious arm on him. That is for certain. And absolutely, that was one of the things for me, that battle between Viv Richards and Devon. Because here was this young, upstart, Jamaican boy, Devon Malcolm, born in Jamaica. And the crowd were on against Devon. And Viv went out with that cap on like he did and the strut and the swagger. And it was the end of, let's be honest, it was coming towards the end of the great Viv Richards era. But Viv was so proud that he was never, ever going to put a helmet or anything like that on. He was going to take um, Dev on with that maroon cap and Dev bowled the speed of light in that series. Oh, he's got him. He's got to be out. Yes, LBW. Good night, Charlie. He's on his way. That one kept low as well and it may well have been going right into the middle of middle and leg, I'd say. At times, he didn't know where he was going, but it was seriously quick. I mean, facing him in the net, Sal, I always used to re remember looking at the sheet I'm making sure. I'd, I'll take Gus. You take Dev, please. Yeah. <laughs> we all want to take Gus, though, didn't we? We all want to buy against Gus. Dev was back bowling in net one. You have to watch out in net two in case. <laughs> that in there, but. But we'll just we'll, we'll get back to that. But we want to get Goff in on his debut. Four years later, I think it was in '94. What are your memories, Goff? Uh, well, I remember debut in the one days to start with, didn't I? And um, it was at uh, Edgbaston. It was quite cold. Um, and I, I really, not come from nowhere, but it was a late run in 93 that got me England to look at me. And then um, I was just on standby for the West Indies. And then I got my chance, didn't I, uh, in that one day against New Zealand. Who was your I first? Uh, Martin Crow, Coach Stewart, slip. What were you doing that slip, by the way? Why? Well, I don't know. I should have been at deep cover the way you bowl. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually bowled quite well, mate. I got Martin Crow, yeah, one did. of the greatest players. Bruce, I had a <laughs> hand, that, hand that catch. All summer I had a bruised hand because it was so quick or cold. Yeah, yeah it was cold. It was cold. But I tore my side. I didn't realise at the time. I'd come back and bowled a little bit of reverse. And not many guys had, I don't think many English fans had seen an English type bowler who was quite skinny, bowled a little bit of reverse swing at the end and got another wicket or so. But then I woke up the next morning, if you remember, everybody was talking about I was going to possibly be playing in the test match against New Zealand. Then I tore my side. And that put me out for another six weeks and out of the first two tests. Story of my career, really, wasn't it? I never really got on a roll. Um, so I missed the first two, watching, coming back from injury. And then the debut came at, at Old Trafford. Quite a flat pitch, actually, from where I remember. Uh, it must have been because I got a few runs. Uh, but that, <laughs> that's what I remember of it, really. It, it wasn't much my bowling. It was actually getting off to a flyer with a bat and smacking it everywhere. And just, I, I actually believed I was going to hit every ball for four. I promise you. And, and now and again, very rarely, I know I underachieved as a batsman. And I know sometimes I entertained as a batsman. But that day, I actually thought, well, it doesn't matter who's bowling. I thought I was going to hit every ball for four. It was unbelievable. Uh, to be in that zone. And I was so, I was going to swear then, I was so annoyed when I got out for 65 because I thought I was going to go get 100. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Convinced I was going to get 100. In my head, I was getting 100. And I was so disappointed to get 65. 
Did you know, Stewie, um, after 12, I think it was 12 tests, that we're averaging 33 with a bat? And what with the ball? <laughs> Probably about 33. <laughs> <laughs> but I finished. My test average finished with like 13, which is ridiculous. I should have been at least 16. I really, that's annoyed me more than anything. I didn't matter about the bowling average. But my batting average 13, it puts me on the nugget trail, doesn't it? It puts me up there with <laughs> the likes of McGrath and Bullerithery and all that rubbish. Malali. But realistically, I was a lot better than that. I mean, it's great we've got one of England's greatest bowlers ever to come on and talk about his batting. <laughs> 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 Superb delivery from Goff. England get an early breakthrough. Elliot's clean bowled, and Australia are 11 for one. Yeah. Bowl him! Darren Goff has done it to Mark Waugh. That answers any criticism of English cricket. And again, the value of pitching the ball up has worked well for Michael Atherton's team. The bowling was always going to happen, mate. I mean, if you, you back yourself as a bowler, you got a new ball in your hand. Uh, you've got a chance with a new ball. And my advantage in the 90s was uh, when I was bowling in a good era as well. And there were a lot of good fast bowlers about. A lot of them, I, was, I mean, Malcolm Marshall, um, Courtney Walsh. You've got McGrath. You've got Craig McDermott. You've got Wackard and Wazim, which were out of this world. They're just a few I looked up to. But I had the advantage of then, after the new ball, I never felt out of the game. I always felt as though I could get a wicket. So if I picked up one or two with a new ball, and I want the best new ball bowler. There are better bowlers out there by a mile than me with a new ball in my hand. I might pick up the odd one here and there. But I always knew when I came back for my second spell, my third spell, I'd got a big ticker, I could bowl a bit of reverse, and I might just cash in with three or four for happy day. Oh, go. Cutter just left it. It's a nip back from just about an off stump line. And rattled his stumps. Goff gets a breakthrough and Katic is gone. England have waited a while for that. Was it easier when Arthur had been putting dirt on the ball or not? <laughs> well, that was bowling when he did that. Me and uh, Ian Salisbury. Uh, I mean, for someone who's educated as well as Michael Atherton, there's all for keeping the ball dry, wasn't it? Which we all planned to do that day. But putting dirt and sprinkling on the ball, what's he thinking we're going to do? Grow plants out of it? I mean, <laughs> what was he thinking? The idea is, you see spinners do it all the time. They put their hand onto the, uh, the crease and they keep the ball dry, right? That would be the way to do it. That's what Salisbury was doing. He was bowling. I was at the other end, obviously getting a little bit of reverse at Lords against South Africa. And he's there sprinkling dirt on it. Remarkable. <laughs> Remarkable. Innocence. It was total innocence from Atherton. He didn't even know what he was doing. For someone so educated, did not have a clue what he was doing. Now, so, I mean, in that area as well, you talk about the great player, it must have been nice to have someone like Goffey come through with that sort of energy. Not only the ability with the ball, but everything else that he brought through with it. I was just going to say, actually, what my initial memories of Goff was not Goff the cricketer, because I didn't coincide with Goff. I was out the side then, I think. Atherton or someone had left me out. I broke my wrist. Gooch had left me out, etc. Um, and I just remember watching Goff on telly. And it wasn't just his bowling that almost inspired me to carry on playing cricket and the nation to watch cricket. It was the way Darren played the game. Darren played with an incredible... And this was an era where we were a pretty miserable side, let's be honest. You know, we were down. We were being beaten. There weren't many smiles on the faces of either England players or England fans. And what I remember from Goffey was he seemed to play with a smile on his face. And he quickly became like that housewife's favourite, if you don't mind me saying. <laughs> you know, he was this young, swashbuckling, slimmer individual back then oh. who ran in and gave it his all. And whether it was good or bad, he would walk back to his mark and play with a massive smile on his face. Was that just natural for you, Goffey? You know, I remember you as captain. You used to just love a camera. You were never seem to have a fear of failure. Was there any bravado in you or was that absolutely natural? Well, I used to love a camera unless it were after <laughs> 10 o'clock at night and then I'd hide it from him. But um, I would say, yeah, it was pretty natural. I, I always believe, um, I always from a young kid wanted to be a professional sportsman and work in Saturday night television. That was, I, that was just me. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to entertain. So I considered myself, Saturday night entertainment wasn't there at that 
that time. So oh, cricket, and the wall me, wasn't there? No, I know it wasn't there. That came later. But for me, it was just about being an entertainer and, and enjoy what you're doing. And I'm, I, I honestly feel I'm lucky. And I don't think that many people realise this, but I never actually went to a cricket match and watched a professional cricket match at all. The first time I went to a proper ground was when I was playing for Yorkshire's second team. I'd never even been to a cricket match. One match throughout my whole upbringing, never been. And it was all about football for me. That was my first love. It still is. Cricket was something I was better at, and it gave me a fantastic career. Oh, he's got it. What a performance. This is fantastic cricket from England who are on fire at Edgbaston. Goff stayed in control of himself. He didn't let the disappointment of uh, the wicket off the no ball get to him. They clung onto a catch and there are problems here for the Australians. You, you were exactly the same, Goffy. Whether you got, not that you ever did probably, not for 100 or whether you got 60 oh, I did. 20. <laughs> your attitude and your approach, your personality, your character was so consistent. And that's what I loved about you. I always said, you know, when you get asked, few games I kept. You're always my first pick player because I knew exactly what I was getting with you. You know, you'd run through a brick wall for your team, for your country, your captain. And that's why I just love you, you know, because you've had it tough. You've mentioned injuries and things, but regardless, whether you're on a high or on a low, you're exactly the same person, which I think is a real credit to you. I was probably in public, but I think I'm the same as everyone. I've had this discussion about people talk about mental toughness and all that stuff. And, and you know, in my room, I used to be going nuts. I used to go nuts because I was worried what people were thinking. I wanted to impress people all the time. So you kind of, you it's not a lie, is it? It's just you put on this strength of character. Um, a lot of it is natural. But sometimes, even though I was probably down inside and thinking, dear me, I can't end up with another ball as bad as that in the second innings. I tried to let it all go in my dressing room. And I know I joke about it, and I have done when I've given these caps out to the odd player here and there. And I say, best thing to do, go to your room, not go and tap and get 150 in your bedroom like Nasi used to, just tapping his bat all night. But actually go in there, write down all the negative stuff from the day, write it on a piece of paper, rip it all up, put it in the bin. And then I used to go downstairs and just go, right, fight at Carlsberg, love. And that's how, and that's how I used to... That's how I used to try and forget about everything and the next day start again. So I always try to have that air of positivity because I would say in, in real life, I'm quite a negative person. In sport, I'm positive, but in everyday life, I'm a typical Yorkshire girl. I'm Victor Meldrew, man. One thing you were was very competitive, whether you were playing with Fraser, Cork, Caddick. Yep. Um, and also, you, you used to have a list in your cricket case, didn't you, in your cricket coffin of people who had taken, for England bowlers, who had taken more wickets than you. Why did you have that? Um, um, when did that start? It started pretty early on. Um, it was, I got the list of England's greatest ever bowlers in my, in my case. And the idea was, when I passed one, to cross it off. <laughs> and the ambition was to get right to the top. That was my inspiration. That was what inspired me to to keep training, to keep running in, to keep bowling Yorkers, to keep trying to bowl quick. Bowl in. Great bit of bowling from Darren Goff. A magnificent innings comes to a close, and it took a magnificent bit of cricket to finish it. I look back and probably thought I could have helped myself a little bit better, could have not parted as hard at some points in my career. But I always trained hard when I was bowling in the nets and I always believed I could go out there and get anybody out until the injuries started to come. And like I said, I mean, you look at my last three series, I was taking wickets, 20 odd wickets a series, and then suddenly got struck down uh, with the knee injury, which obviously Nasser, you were the captain, you saw the state I was in uh, when I realised that my career was basically done. Because me as a bowler, I was never going to be a Jimmy Anderson who can step off five miles an hour and start been brilliant with his wrist, left and right, in swing, out swing, and all that stuff, and accuracy. It's a different game now anyway. But I was getting my wickets because I had pace, I was skiddy, I got the great Yorker, and they're gone. Because yes, I got a Yorker still, but it was 85 miles an hour rather than being 88 miles an hour. That's a big difference. That's a big, big difference. Stuart, you talk about Goffey and 
everything that he brought, his demeanour. You had Nas as well. My memory from sort of watching it, Nas was slightly more intense. Almost, you could tell when he got out, you look at those clips when he's getting sawn off time and time again, you can see the frustration on his face. You were a little bit the opposite, Stuart, from my memory. You very rarely gave much away. Is that fair? Yeah, I guess so. I, I was never a, you know, when I got out, I was never a bat thrower. I wouldn't put my foot through a door or foot through a fridge. <laughs> um, when I've been bowled out and still said it was missing. Um, but, but it was, it was just, I think, the way I am. I, I looked up with Graham Good, you know, so much. And I know NASA um, played with yeah. Gucci at Essex, but... As soon as I met Graham Gooch in that England set, I played against him a little bit and then but saw how he went about his business. I learned so much from him um, and I never saw him throw his back. I, and everyone is different. But by the time you get, you got out and by the time you get back to the dressing room, if you kind of really got over that dismissal, the shot you played or the ball you got, what difference does it make once you're in that dressing room? Um, some of it not aimed at NAS, but some people I think do it for show or if they're embarrassed that they've just got out. But, you know, if it helps them, so be it. But now I try not to give anything away, you know, whether it's say, whether it was getting out. I saw the other day they showed that dismissal in Sri Lanka, that LBW one. I think it's two <laughs> It was probably that bad, a, <laughs> that bad a decision that I was in shock as against in anger. Um, but no, I try not to give too much away. My big thing, and boycott to be fair, um, when Nass and me went up to Headingley for Nets before we went out on our first tour, he had the young bowlers, what would have been academy bowlers um, in today's tour, bowling off 17 yards trying to hit us on the head. And I'd, I'd been batting, it'd be, I think we used to bat, bat 45 minutes, Nass, didn't we? It yeah. was pretty tough. I was one of them, Stewie. Were you? Well, before you went to West Indies, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Rob yes. Bailey, Rob Bailey and all that stuff, yeah? That's it, that's it. Yeah. So you Oh, yeah. was that? Oh, right. Well, he obviously made an impact on me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I only hit you a couple of times. I reacted. It may have been Goffey's bowling, but I got a short ball that I didn't play as well as I should have done. And I reacted. I showed disappointment. And Boycott walked down the net and just said to me, he said, listen, he said, you've been playing well. He said, but one thing you should never, ever do is show the opposition that they've got the better of you. He said, you'll all make mistakes. He said, average players make more mistakes. Good players make very few mistakes. And he said, the greats of the game, and when I'm talking about the greats, I'm talking about Bradman, Gavisca, Boycott. <laughs> he did, he we said that, that did he? <laughs> did he say, let's say that again. I promise you, that's what he said. Um, so that's why I tried not to show too much emotion um, if it went if it went wrong, if I got out, if I, if I got a hundred now and again, then I'd like to celebrate, but otherwise try to keep my emotions in check. Al, it's your birthday today, but it's also the anniversary of that great week in Barbados. Hundred in both innings against a fantastic bowling attack. What were your memories of that? And was that about as well as you've ever played? And there it is, Alex Stewart has become the first Englishman to score a century in each innings of a test match against the West Indies. Alex Stewart, Surrey and England, 100 not out. Yeah, it's got to be up there. I still think, actually, you were captain. To, um, when we had West Indies in Zimbabwe over in 2000, 2001, was it? Yeah, yeah. I, I had a purple patch of about six weeks when I reckon that's as well as I've played but those two innings in Barbados yeah because of the quality the quality of the bowling um they had Walsh and Ambrose right they had Benjamin Benjamin it wasn't quite Marshall Patterson Bishop whoever but we've had it tough and we were just being rolled for 46 yeah. in Trinidad um, then we went to Barbados, where there's a lot of English support. And I mean, I love the island anyway. But when we walked out, Afters and myself walked out to bat there, it was like home from home. And it was a great pitch. It was a pacey pitch, but good even bounce. And I was, you know, quite enjoyed the challenge of playing quick bowling and short pitch bowling. I was able to get the hook and the pull out now and again. Um, <laughs> but yeah, to string those two scores together and the way I played and what it meant to the team that we won. I don't think we'd won there for, is it 50 mm. odd years or something? 
at that time, um, yeah, it's right up there, Nass. It has to be. And that's it. All over. England have won in vision of the ground. And England have beaten the West Indies here at Kensington Oval by 208 runs. Well, that's a fantastic performance by England. Absolutely amazing. In all my cricket years, I've never seen a team so down, 3-0 down, bowled out for 46, and come back when all the records were against them winning at a particular ground. Stewie, what about you... when you were captain... Sorry, lads. What about no, when you were captain ahead. in that game at Edinburgh when we beat South Africa? That must have been a, a great moment in your career as well because that could have gone either way on that last morning, couldn't it? Uh, listen, I've always said, and Nash is far better place to talk about this because he captained for a length of time, but I always felt as a captain, you, you felt success and defeat far more than if you're just a player. But to win, yeah, my first series um, in charge with you, getting the, um, getting the winning wicket, I assume that's why he brought the subject. <laughs> um, <laughs> Not at all, mate. <laughs> but no, obviously that, that was massive because we... I think I'm right to say we hadn't won a test series of more than three test matches in like 13 or 14 years. Mm. And then we'd gone one nil down in the comeback and win 2-1. Obviously, that series was when we saw the Atherton Donald um, little confrontation with Nass sat with his legs crossed at the other end, <laughs> not getting down the other end. Uh, but it all you know, say, came to a, a massive moment when you got um, when you got that winning wicket. Was it out, Goffy? They still go on about that in South Africa. Was it out? Umpire's decision, mate. <laughs> Umpire's decision, wasn't it? You put on the replay, it's hitting leg stump. He's out. <laughs> Gone, isn't he? We'd have had 400 know. test wickets these days, wouldn't we? <laughs> hey, imagine all runs you'd have got, Al. Not <laughs> out. I mean, NASA's always moaning about decisions he got. He'd have had his 58. <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't he? I, rem I remember that. I remember watching that. I remember the Donald... Atherton and Nass, as you say, batting. And I remember thinking that's the time on TV when it showed pace as well as it ever has done. And then I remember that next morning, because I think you were trying to bowl them out that night, weren't you, in South Africa, to win the Test match and the series. And then you had to come back the next day. Did you think you could do it? I can't remember the difference of what you needed. I think we needed was it two wickets, Goffing. Yeah, it's two wickets. And... They needed whatever it was, 30 What or, was it, 27 or 32? Yeah, I can't, it was one of them. 30, something like so. And we came in and tried to do it, you know, as a normal day, even though we, we knew it, it was only going to last an hour maximum. Athers, as I say, been a massive part of the, of the team for the last 10, 12 years. He was actually ill. He'd, um, he had to go to hospital, so he actually missed it. They opened the gate. Everyone's up. spirits, to be honest. We were all quite <laughs> chuffed with that. <laughs> and Yorkshire, to be fair to them, they opened the gates up for free. So it was full up because the Yorkies love a free. It's Yorkshire. <laughs> and Goffey. <was> lovely. <laughs> Goffey but had all his mates in. It, um, <laughs> it was just one of those mornings where, yeah, it was going either way. And we were nervous. You know, whatever you say, we were nervous. We were on edge, as were South Africa. Um, but going back to the bloke there, Goffey, having him in the team... Knowing what he can offer, I backed myself and backed the team all the way. But it was, it was nervy because the, the day before, we took five wickets pretty quick. Um, mm. And then I think it was John T. Rhodes and McMillan possibly had a bit of a partnership. And I remember going to Nass. Nass was vice captain. I went to him and said, look, what do you think? And, and he actually spoke about just moving the field a little bit. Um, anyway, it, to cut a long story short, it worked. And then we got the wickets and then, yeah. um, then it went on from there that we needed two the next day. But now, massive, brilliant moment. And that was the first time where I felt that the country got behind the, the team. Yeah. Whereas before, it'd been a real struggle in the 90s. Yeah, we were... If everyone was fit, we had a good side. But yeah. the way the selectors were, we had a lot of injuries and the poor selection and the selection policy hindered us. Um, but then we had, you know, we had a good... 10 days of good public backing until we played Sri Lanka at the Oval on a big fun <laughs> square. Fun square. <laughs> when, when was it that the sun sent you all to the moon, talking about the public and the press not getting behind you? times, I think. <laughs> that was New Zealand. They sent me, Edley, 
um, was it Craig White and Mullally sent us to the moon when we couldn't ball out <laughs> New Zealand? Yeah, when, yeah, when we had the champagne in the bath at lunchtime and um, at closer play, they were still batting. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that, because that's where Bumble... Was manager. Nas, uh, Ack was captain, wasn't he? 97, I think it was. Yeah, if you remember, we came off and Bumble was sat in the middle of the rugby pitch, rocking, wasn't it? <laughs> Just rocking. We were, we were wondering, said, never mind, lads, you've tried your hardest there. It was the flattest thing. We could not get Danny the Duck out, Danny Morrison. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we tried everything. Toughers. Toughers were lobbing them up one into the rough. He bought all day toughers, I think, on an absolute bunsen. But it wasn't really bouncing. And we couldn't ball them out and they sent us to the moon in a rocket. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing I did, when I was looking last night, I was just having a, trying to jog my memory of stuff. The thing that I noticed, actually, you all ended up playing pretty much, a lot of your cricket was against Australia. I think, Nass, you, out of your, all your test matches, 23 or 24 of them were against the Aussies, similar for all of you. So you didn't have some of the easier test matches, with no disrespect to the Bangladeshis and some of the teams playing these days. What was Ashes cricket like against that side? I mean, me personally, I mean, you come on, I think Goffey absolutely loved it. You look at Goff's record in Ashes cricket, but I love that era, Rob. I know you want to talk about Ashes cricket, but I get asked a lot, you know, wouldn't you like to have played now or something? Some of the bowling attacks the last five years where there hasn't, the pace has come back recently, actually. But actions have been tightened up and people, you know, the spinners aren't quite there that there were. I would always want to play in that era, that yeah. 90s era, good or bad. You look at the sides we played against, Australia, Pakistan with Wakar and Wazim, South Africa, Donald Pollock and Tini, et cetera. I mean, we... I loved playing in that era. Yes, we lost a lot of games, but you'll know this. You started this by saying you sat there watching. It was very watchable cricket. You just did not know what you'd get from that England cricket team. There were a lot of bad days, but there were some good days as well, I tell you. And some of the cricket was absolutely magnificent. There weren't many dull days, I have to be honest. Playing Ashes cricket, for me, uh, was the pinnacle. We had worn on. One of the first um, vodcasts yeah. was worn on. And facing up against Shane Warne or Mark War or Steve War or whoever absolutely is the reason. You know, Alex said he used to go to maths and English or whatever and wanting to play an England cricketer. That's why he wanted to play cricket, to play against cricketers like that. It was brilliant. And it was real tough, Keezy. You know, that's the thing. If you look at all our, you know, all our records, certainly my I lost so many test matches. But then you think that, that Australian side would go down as one of the greatest sides ever in the mm. history of the game. They were that good. And, yeah, they had a hold, not just over England, but over everyone. But I'm, speaking, I'm sure for every single player that I played with, when we went out to play against Australia, we still backed ourselves. Yeah. Just the fact they were better than us. You know, that was the thing. Man for man, they were better. And you, if you were going to pick potentially a, a, an 11 of the 90s, there'd be a number of those Australians in there. They were... You know, McGrath and Vaughan obviously speak for themselves, but the batting lineup, you know, was just second to none. Uh, and it was tough, but I still loved it. You know, I hated losing. But playing against them, feeling as though you're in the battle, and, you know, Nassie's double hundred at Edgbaston, you know, it's going to be a highlight of his career. Absolutely. And we won that game, and, and it just goes to show that when we had a good side out and available, we could challenge, but we didn't do it well enough for long enough. That was a frustrating mm. What a way to do it. England victorious in the first test match of 1997. And in dramatic style, just 21 and a bit overs for the 118 needed to take victory that has come by nine wickets. A magnificent performance in England in every department of the game in a match of rare fascination. Yeah, it was consistency, wasn't it, guys? I mean... I always say this about the 90s. People, we get a lot of criticism, say we were a rubbish team, but we weren't. If the selection uh, would have been a lot better and we'd have played with some of the players we know we should have played with during that era consistently, I think we'd have been, even, we'd have been a lot better than we actually were. I thought, honestly, in 97, we had a chance uh, to go 1-0 up. Um, it just wasn't meant to be. And that was us in the 90s, inconsistency. I thought we went to Australia, 98, 99. I thought, hang on a minute, you never know, you never just know, especially, was that where we had rain, 98, 99? We got rescued yeah. in the first one. 
Brisbane, we got saved. And, we, and that's an hard one uh, for us. And I just thought we get through. I, said, I actually believed in some of the cricket we played there in Melbourne and in Sydney that we played there on in Edgbaston. We when we performed like we know we all can, we could beat anyone. But we just lacked consistency. The selection wasn't consistent. But even Zimbabwe in the nineties, right? And this is not a dig. Zimbabwe in the nineties, they had some terrific players. Yeah. And that yeah. was not an easy game when you rocked up against Zimbabwe. I know we joke about the chicken farmer. He's <laughs> big, but I tell you what, he could bowl. You know what I mean? Edo Branders. Yeah. Edo Branders yeah. and they had East Street. They had that the was flowers. another headline, Rob. Bowled out by a chicken farmer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the Teletubbies. We, them. we also had the Teletubbies, didn't we? <laughs> Me, Edley, Crofty. Teletubbies. Front page when we uh, had a shocking performance. I can't remember who that was against. That might have been Zimbabwe. Or something like why, that. Crofty, why, did, why do you think Australia brought the best out of you, mate? Did you just enjoy that stage? Or, I mean, like the hat-trick at Sydney, the initial success you had against them, did that help? 94, when I first went out there, I was gobsmacked when I walked through the airport and I saw all them cameras. <laughs> to me, that was like, this is it. This is the big time. Because that was my first England tour. I went, wow. I was the new kid on the block, the young kid. I sat between Gooch and Gat on the plane. One drinking red wine, one drinking white, me in the middle with a beer. You know what I mean? And I got there and the cameras were everywhere. And I remember we got to go to a kit launch and they had to go on stage and people were asking guys to do it and nobody would go on. I said, I'll go on. <laughs> and they put me up against Merv Hughes. And that was the moment I thought, I ain't taking no backward step here. I don't know if you remembers. I went on stage and Merv is massive. He's huge and he intimidated a lot of England batsmen. I stood up beside of him Stood up face to face with him, looking up at him, and I literally stared him out. There were no smiling. How were you and face thought, to face with Merv Hughes? Were you on a chair or something? <laughs> so I mean, I was looking up at him, <laughs> and he was trying to intimidate me. And I thought, he ain't intimidating me, this bloke. I used to watch him and, and intimidate England batsmen, and I just stood my ground and didn't flinch. And I think, and I spoke to him since that, and he remembers it, and he just said, he thought, oh, hang on a minute, we've got a little feisty one here. This could be interesting. And ended up having a good series. But that's where Australia did things well, wasn't it? They, they made you feel uncomfortable, try to make you feel yeah. uncomfortable. You know, when sides used to come here, we'd bend over backwards to be the best host, <laughs> give them everything that they wanted. Yet when well, you go to Australia, and they just wanted to belittle you. You know, that's before you even got on the cricket field. And that's why you say what you've said there, Goff, is absolutely spot on. And Because you think of other pictures, a picture isn't there, of Merv Hughes sort of looking at Graham Hick. Yeah. And just got him out. Well, Hickey, you know, was such a wonderful player. And I've always said if there were pe perhaps central contracts back in the day then, or a better selection policy, your likes of Hick, Ramprakash, I think mm. they've had wonderful careers, but I agree. You know, got seven, eight, nine times each, which, you know, how can you feel part of a team Keith. when you know the selectors are behaving the way they did? Keezy, I can't tell you the importance of central contracts. I mean, you know, they came in with Lord McLaurin and I was very lucky to have them being brought in. Alex started it actually just before the World Cup. And I tell you what, before central contracts, we used to turn up, we used to look around the dressing room, oh, Stewie's here again, Goffey's here, Lammy's got the, which was Lammy, Oakley's or Bolle's. Judge used to have, Robin Smith used to have the Bolle's or the Oakley's. <laughs> You used to have a look at your paycheck, or I'm getting a grand or whatever. We might lose a bit for the overrate fine. Um, and then you turn up the next week, right, who's here this week? Our oh, Tuffers ain't here. Why ain't Tuffers here? And we were predominantly county players that used to turn yeah. up and occasionally yeah. play for England. And after central contracts, we were England players that occasionally played for our county. And that might sound like a small change, but actually it was a monumental mental change. When your number one team is England, then you can build everything around it. You know, Athers used to, poor old Gus and Devon used to turn up, having bowled 40 overs, Gus in particular, mm -hmm. for Middlesex on a Tuesday. You lose the toss on a Thursday against Australia, you're in the dirt, and Athers is throwing the ball to Gus, saying, go on, have another bowl, uh, you know. And it was just ridiculous the way we used to look after our bowlers in the 90s in particular. There's Central no such, contracts was the biggest change. There's no such thing that was as resting bowlers or even resting players. It, you know, you summed it up perfectly. You'd finish a test match on a Monday. On the Tuesday, you're playing a Benson Hedges game or yeah. 
50, yeah. 55 over game or a championship game. It just, we didn't give ourselves a chance of being successful for a long period of time. In 95, we lost against the West Indies uh, at Edgbaston. They absolutely smashed us. Yeah, we, uh, we all got sent off that day um, to play the next day. Judgy had been battered left, right and centre. Um, and I played, we, I drove down Hampshire, I was playing against him the next day. I had to play in a game the next day against Judgy after we just played a test match. Because it finished two days early, we lost in three days. Right, you've got to play the next day, drive to Hampshire, play a one day, play then another Benson Edges game, and then go back for the next test match two days later. Impossible, and, and I agree. I didn't really benefit from the central contracts. I, I only had one year of it because of the injury, but it's so vital, and you can see now, as a bowler, you can imagine Dean Edley on a central contact. He was a fantastic performer. But look mm-hmm. at the always he bowled, you know what I mean, time and time again. Bowlers in my era, if you played 50 test matches, you, you'd had a, a, a good career, unbelievable career. Now bowlers all around the world are playing 100 test matches. If you're and any good, you're going to play 100 plus. Proof of central contracts, Anderson and Broad. I tell you, yeah. Yeah. The, their longevity, the way they've stuck at it, their fitness, their skill, obviously... But they have, they have been, you know, England have been rewarded with those two because of central contracts. If you mirrored that, Nass, going back in the 90s, of a Devon Malcolm, an Angus Fraser, Darren Goff, Dominic Cork, Dean Headley, just to name five there, yeah. that's a very, very good bowl or squad of bowlers that you can rest and rotate. But I know yeah. we're all harking back and what's happened's happened, but that's why I'm, I'm always going to defend my era or our era that we had the quality but we just didn't yeah. have them available enough together. Did you, get, did you get nervous with the whole selection policy? Because that's what, I mean, you got, NASA came in and straight away there became some consistency to selection. In your era, I know you touched on it a few times, did, even you guys at the start, did you think, hang up, this might be my last test match here. This is such a volatile system and this is adding to what already is a pretty tough task. 100%. And, and that's why you come in back to say the emotion that perhaps I didn't show um, outwardly is because you don't want to give anything away. So you were, you know, until for me, until I scored my first test hundred, I was always thinking, one is, am I good enough to play at this level? Um, but secondly, am I going to get left out? And I think, I think my first hundred was after 13 test matches from memory. But I think I've been dropped three times leaning into yeah. that and did well with Surrey and got back in or dad was manager and picked me. <laughs> <laughs> Always helped. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a fish and chip shop for a week first time. Um, but no, on a serious note, that's just how it was. Um, and then fortunately I, I strung some hundreds together, um, which meant I'd established myself. But for others, and this is why I come back to Hickey and, and Ramps, two of the best county players by a country mile in the 90s. They're prolific. Their run scoring was prolific. And their ability and talent to me said they should have been averaging back then near a 50 in test match cricket, yeah. but they were both either side of 30, I think, because of this ridiculous selection policy that was there at the time. Everyone was looking for the magic formula instead of looking at the best squad of players. And then yet you're allowed to have a bad game or two bad games. But if you had one bad innings, you were out. And then someone else came in. That's it. Alex Short's got his 100. Kensington rising to him. A couple of English supporters have come onto the ground. Alex Short, a happy man, his first century against the West Indies. His fifth in all. And on this, his 31st birthday, he couldn't have wanted a better present to have given to himself. Al, there were a lot of messages today about your um, birthday. I exaggerate a lot of messages, one or two, mainly from you, <laughs> Mickey, and people like that. Um, uh, and underneath them, it, underneath them, it said, could you imagine how good a player Alex Stewart would have been if he had just opened the batting? Now, don't give me any waffle, please, about <laughs> team man and I'll do what's best for the team. Alex Stewart's <laughs> career... Would you have preferred just to be an opening batsman or what you ended up being, which was, you know, a brilliant wicketkeeper batsman? Which would you have preferred? Uh, listen, 100%. I've always said I loved opening a batting. It's an absolute given that. And 
I'm not a stat man, I'll leave it to Goffey, but I understand my <laughs> opening record is just a fraction better than Jeffrey Boycott's. He'll come on and tell us otherwise. But I, I, I think I was, I was mid, mid or just above mid-40s um, opening a batting against those attacks. Yeah. I, I love walking out the back, whether it's with Gucci or Atters, opening a batting. And, you know, one of my best mates in the game is Jack Russell. You know, people always saw that as a rivalry. It was anything but. It was the actual circumstances that... We didn't have an all-rounder. England tried to find a new Ian Botham and, and they couldn't. And that's when I then became the all-rounder. So by choice, mate, not 100%. Right. If I was, had it my way, thought nothing other than of me, I'd have opened a batting. Right. Now that's gone down the hill. Alex Stewart is scampering like mad. And he's coming back for his 100. That's his eighth in Test cricket. And he is absolutely delighted about that. Same celebrations at Barbados. It's a long wait for Alex Stewart. He hasn't scored 100 since 1994 against the New Zealanders at Lords. Taken 29 innings. But it's been worth the wait for Alex Stewart. It's been quite a commanding innings by the Surrey captain. What, what always sort of sums it up for me of how good a player you were. Not only did well, you like, not, that, can you say again? <laughs> <laughs> not only not only did you have to keep, not only were you up and down the batting order, with all of that, you still averaged more than what NASA did when he was just an out and out <laughs> batsman. Right, Rob. We have to cut that bit out. <laughs> Goffey, one of my favourite stories in cricket, and I know you pretty well, so I've heard it a few times. Speaking of doing well against Australia, tell us about the hat-trick in Sydney. How long well, we got? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to go into the old story. Uh, but oh, come on. Do you know something? No, 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 no. That was, it was a, listen, it was a proud moment, that, because, um, like I say, I believe we had a good team um, in that series. I bowled well with Dean Headley. I wish I could have bowled with him a lot more. Imagine a bowling attack with Goff, Caddick, Headley and Cork. That, for me, would have been the dream four. Um, I don't think we actually played a test match together. That four would have been awesome. But me and Edley had got a good little roll going. He bowled reverse as well. He was tall. He could swing the ball. Um, and getting that hat-trick there and having him on the back foot for a couple of test matches was a great moment. And, and actually, the hat-trick is a strange one because... I actually thought I was knackered from bowling the overs we bowled in Melbourne. So I wasn't probably at my best in Sydney. I've got is Melbourne, to... sorry, Goff, is Melbourne when you'd had that ridiculously long session towards yeah. the end of the game? Right, OK. Yeah, yeah, it, it was. Stewie were captain there, weren't you, Stewie? Yeah, and you got the winning wicket. You got, out, you got the winning wicket again there, didn't you? I'm, I'm sick of saying about getting the winning wickets because it just happened so many times. But anyway, let's go back on to see. But it was just before you go back to you. Sorry, Go Goffy, is this the short version of this story? Sorry. <laughs> It'll be as long as that last session in Melbourne, four and a bit hours. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was a great test match, that. And we were all exhausted after that. That was one of the best moments. Along with winning in Pakistan and Sri Lanka, that Melbourne test match for me was the highlight. What a celebration. That was the first time we really got together as a team, I believe. We celebrated together with our families. I'll never forget that. Then we went on to Sydney. Let's say they won the toss, they were buying. And I got the hat-trick. I got three wickets for three balls. I didn't mean to bowl. Uh, I didn't mean to bowl <laughs> any single one of those deliveries. That's basically the idea of the story. Um, but yeah. It, what did Corky say, say to you? Well, Corky come running on, didn't he? And said, come on, you can join the club, I thought. <laughs> I said, mate, I said, yours was against the rubbish West Indies side at Old Trafford. This is Australia, best team in the world. Get yourself off. <laughs> 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 and then I got it. And, and like I say, it's a shot. You don't get a chance to do anything. All I remember was John Crawley running at me. Alex Studer, I think it was, was he on his 12th man. He, and he, he's basically, I went back with my head and I nearly smashed his teeth in. Uh, the picture of that, but amazing moment, and you don't actually realise what you've done there. Your own personal milestone. Stewie talks about them two hundreds uh, at, at Barbados, but when you do something like that, it's you only realise after when people say, "Oh, can you sign my ticket? Can you sign sign this?" Uh, Ian Ely were the first one to ring me up the next morning. Can I do a print? 
um, of your hat trick. I've got it up here somewhere. I should show you. Well, I've, I've got it up here. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> you come to my house. You literally come to my house. There's no memorabilia except this. This is the only bit, which is that's the attic. Oh yeah. So that's that's it with a ticket, I think, inside. The balls. I've got the ball and boots. I've got to get the boots out. And I've also got to show you one little bit, uh, bit of memorabilia, which my captain, for all my blood and toil and everything I put in for him. Hang on. This is a never-ending story. You remember giving me this, Nas? <laughs> <laughs> get it out of the shed. <laughs> <laughs> he said well, it, Ryan, to Darren, thanks for keeping me in a job or something. <laughs> <laughs> to the best bowler I ever captained. Thanks, <laughs> Nas, for the same. That Sorry, all them others. Hey, Caddy's got the same message. <laughs> no, you, he's got your shirt, Danny Stewie. <laughs> Caddy's got yours. Hang on. Uh, <laughs> Hang on. You can see that, you can hear the emotion in his voice. You really can. <laughs> this is why he's gone now. Gone. <laughs> I've not touched him. <laughs> I've got, I wrote on him five for 96, boxing day test, MCG. And three for three at the SCG. <laughs> Can you believe that? Yeah. Still got the boots. Auction them, Des, for NHS. Yeah, see, if you want a ticket for the game as well, I got. <laughs> 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 Do you know the memory of that game, though? Most all my family was over there. All my family was over there. Easy. How long is this podcast, Keezy? <laughs> no, hang on. All my family was over there. It cost me a fortune to fly all the family over. All our families. But they'd all left. So nobody actually saw the attic because we had a party that night for the sponsors. So my whole family, my mum, my dad, my missus, my kids, didn't even see it. <laughs> Has he finished? Boys, thank you so much. So it's been so, literally being... Well, what am I, 40 and growing up watching you all play, I could, could have literally done this for hours and hours. But thank you so much. Uh, hope everyone has enjoyed it and all stay as well as you possibly can. Thanks, guys. Cheers, Keezy. Cheers, Cheers guys. Happy birthday, Al. Happy, Happy birthday. birthday. Thank you. Happy birthday, Al.